Hey there, welcome to LiveWire. I'm your host, Luke Burbank. This week on the show, Michelle Zahner, who you might know as the musician Japanese Breakfast, is going to stop by. She's also the writer of this highly acclaimed memoir. It's called Crying in H Mart. Talks about food and her late mother and how the two of them bonded over cooking. Then we're going to get some stand-up comedy from Sean Patton, talking about the perils of air travel and also his personal campaign to normalize a certain activity in public, um, breaking wind, if we want to keep it public radio friendly. Uh, Then we're going to get some music from Kurt Vial. I'm a huge fan. Turns out Kurt Vial is also a great forklift operator. His new album has been described as a majestically mellow zone-out session. Uh, which I think we're probably all in the mood for this week. So stick around. Things are going to get majestically mellow starting right after this. We love the freedom hip-hop offers, but there's a lot less freedom inside the culture than you might think. This is Louder Than a Riot, a podcast where we explore who hip-hop marginalizes and why it's embedded in the fabric of the culture we love. Listen now to Louder Than a Riot wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, Elena. Hey, Luke. How's it going? It's going great. I'm so excited for this week's show. We've got Kurt Vile, one of my favorite musicians. It's <laughs> going to be awesome. First, though, we've got to start with a little station location identification examination. This is uh, where I tell you about a place in America where LiveWire is on the radio. You try to guess where I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. This place is at the western end of the St. Lawrence Seaway, and it is home to North America's largest and farthest inland freshwater port. Duluth, Minnesota. Absolutely right. You just, I mean, you didn't skip a beat with that one. I didn't have to even tell you that it's also the birthplace of one Robert Zimmerman, aka Bob Dylan. Not Hibbing. Duluth, not That's, Hibbing. Ooh. I've always thought it was Hibbing, but uh-huh. I guess Duluth is now taking uh, taking the credit for being the birthplace of Bob Dylan. Yeah. Well, maybe he moved. <laughs> <laughs> he must have. He was like a rolling stone. That's true. <laughs> oh, that was that's a brutal start to the show. I'm sorry for that. Uh, we should probably get to it. Take it away, Elena. From PRX, it's Livewire. This week, writer and musician Michelle Zahner. One major point of contention between my mom and I was that I had this creative energy and I had this real desire to become a rock musician. And stand up, Sean Patton. I get to every single airport early for one reason, unlimited fast food. With music from Kurt Vile. My, my note to myself is literally just two words. It's gotta yodel, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm your announcer, Elena Passarello, and now the host of Livewire, Luke Burbank. Hey, thank you so much, Elena Passarello. Thanks to everyone for tuning in from all over the country for this amazing episode of LiveWire this week. Of course, we asked our listeners a question. We asked them, what would you like to normalize? We're going to get those responses coming up in a few minutes. First, though, of course, we got to start things with the best news we heard all week. This is our little reminder at the top of the show. There is some good news happening out there in the world. Elena, what is the best news that you saw this week? Reunion story. I <laughs> love these. <laughs> it starts 20 years ago in Utah when Holly Shearer was a teenager who became pregnant and arranged for an adoption. Okay. She met and selected the parents who adopted the baby Benjamin shortly after his birth and then received a few letters for several years, letters and pictures from the adoption agency But then, you know, time passed and the adoption agency closed and Holly always wondered, you know, like, Mm. how's Ben doing? Sort of lost touch, looked for him, found him on social media when he was about Mm. 18, but didn't want to intervene in his life and his childhood. But she had no idea that he had been looking for her this whole time too. The way he was brought up, uh, her name was always mentioned with gratitude. He knew his mom was named Holly and they were, his parents were so grateful to her and, but he didn't even know how to start looking for her. He, he put himself on an adoption registry. He got a DNA test, but he wasn't really sure how to make this happen once he became an adult. Well, fast forward to his 21st birthday, she sends him a text. He's at work. He mm-hmm. like drops the phone. He can't take it. He immediately texts her back and he's just like, when can we meet? When can we meet? And she, she couldn't believe that it was just immediately positive response 
So his family and her family, because she has went on to have two more kids, they all met at Red Robin, huge teary reunion, talked for three hours, rebuilt a bunch of relationships. Ben says he feels whole, um, you know, but the best part about this is Holly works as a medical assistant at a medical center in Salt Lake City where Ben has been volunteering in the NICU unit for years. So they were parking in the same garage. They were passing each other in the hallway at the same time. And they never knew. And now, you know, this is one of those great stories of both people uh, consensually wanted to know each other Mm -hmm. and they did. He can just drop in and grab a cup of coffee with her every time he comes in for his volunteer job. Isn't that amazing? (laughs) That's incredible. So we just like walk down to wherever it is Holly's working and say, hey, mom. Yeah. Should we go down and get some of that legendary hospital coffee out of the machine? That's the only downside to this story is that <laughs> a lot of their, most of the reunions don't get to take place at Red Robin. It's probably right. vending machine, hot cocoa kind of situations. That is incredible. I have a sort of a story of a family. It's about a family of kittens, though. Uh-oh. So this guy named Robert Brantley was driving somewhere on the back roads of Northeast Louisiana. Now, let me just tell you about Robert Brantley. He is a professional shooter, and I've been to his Instagram page, mm. and everything on his Instagram page is about target shooting and you know gear that you use, and like this is a very, let's just say, sort of macho guy in the world, Robert Brantley, and he's driving <laughs> to, his, uh, to the target range being... Robert Brantley, and then he sees a kitten on the side of the road, and he pulls over his Honda, (laughs) and he goes to get the kitten, and then 12 more kittens emerge from the brush. Oh, my God. Like, it was almost like they had a plan. They were like, if there's 12 of us, nobody's picking us up. You, uh, Muffins, you go stand by the road. (laughs) Get their attention. I don't know if any of the cats are named Muffins, but you get the idea. So he's trying to corral these 13 kittens into his Honda, and he starts recording it on his phone because every time he has the trunk open, every time he puts one cat in, another one jumps out. (laughs) They're totally not cooperating with Operation Kitten Rescue. This is what it sounds like. The tactical Honda was not prepared for this. Uh, (laughs) So hard to suck. (laughs) <laughs> At the end, it's kind of hard to make out, but he says, first he says, the tactical Honda is not equipped for this. And then he says, soft-hearted, this sucks. Like he's mad at himself <laughs> that he's saving all these kittens. But he did. He b- brought them all home. As you might imagine, the internet has gone Insane. cuckoo for this. <laughs> and uh, all of the kittens, as of press time, have been adopted out, except a couple that were dealing with some medical stuff. But a vet came and looked at them, and they're on the mend. And so all of these kittens are uh, going to uh, find a, a good home where they can uh, live out their years. Was it just like a mama cat had a bunch of babies in the brush and uh, like a stray cat's kittens? It's unclear huh. if, if maybe somebody had a bunch of kittens and didn't know what to do with them. Oh. Uh, I would say don't drop them off in the wilderness no. if you don't know what to do. There's lots of places that will take them. Yeah. Like me, now that I'm officially a That's cat right. person, Elena. <laughs> <laughs> I bought my cat a treadmill. Nice. My cat has more sophisticated exercise equipment than I do. <laughs> you just have that jump rope. <laughs> I'm going to start calling her Million Dollar Bubbles because I will have spent roughly a million dollars on her by the time it's all said and done. But anyway, uh, kittens being saved in Louisiana. Uh, by an unlikely person. That's the best news that I saw this week. All right, let's get our first guest on over here. She might be best known for her music, uh, which she performs as Japanese Breakfast, but she also knows a lot about food and a lot about grief, as she writes in her amazing memoir, Crying in H Mart, which details her mother's passing and the connection that they made through food. Let's take a listen to this. It's our conversation with Michelle Zahner. This book is incredible. We're also really big fans of your music. I want to start at the beginning, though, of this memoir. What is H Mart, and why do you love it so much? Uh, H Mart is a grocery chain now. Um, It's a Korean grocery chain. And I found myself... um, 
going there a lot after my mom, who is Korean, passed away. And um, it was a real, like, key to my grieving process, I guess. You know, I lived uh, as a caretaker for six months in Eugene during my mom's illness. And for a long time, I could only really remember these really traumatic experiences of like watching her health deteriorate and going to H Mart for the first time it was like uncovering a lot of that sort of trauma and I would see a can of like sweet beans and I'd have this memory of my childhood of when my mom and I would eat like this Korean snow cone together with red bean and uh, different types of fruit and then I would see like um, bangtigi which are like these styrofoam type of like corn they're like rice cakes kind of uh, and I ate them a lot as a kid and so it like helped me excavate a lot of like really beautiful memories that I had of my mom before she was sick and and I became just um so comforted by going there and and going there once once a week I still go there pretty much (laughs) once a week do you find writing something like this a memoir and writing your music do they kind of come from the same place in your brain and your heart or or is are they really different kind of creative experiences they're similar in the way that I feel like you know, you're taking from the same pool of memory and sort of taking a magnifying glass to the ordinary and and discovering meaning and depth and what's extraordinary about that moment. I think that it's basically leaning into your sensitivities as a person for both of those things. Um, Writing a book felt a lot longer and and harder and there are a lot more words and and that was the main difference, I think. Um, you grew up mostly in Oregon and, um, your, your mom is originally was from Korea. Your dad is uh, a white guy from the U S what was that <laughs> like, what was that like, uh, generally speaking in your childhood to kind of grow up in that environment? Um, it was delightful in some ways. I think that as a, as a child, I really felt like I had the best of both worlds. That was something that made me feel very special. Um, obviously like Eugene is not rich with too much diversity in its population. So when I became a teenager, I, I started to, I guess, just feel a little bit uncomfortable being mixed race. Um, you know, obviously like Eugene is like a pretty like outward facing liberal town. Um, so I wouldn't say that I encountered like a tremendous amount of you know, aggressive racism. Uh, But, you know, when you're a teenager, any small difference in your person and character, like, feels, you know, just like a scab, like (laughs) anything that marks you as different. And so I think in my adolescence, I sort of shirked that part of my identity for a long time. And then it wasn't until my mom got sick that I found myself sort of chasing after something I had pushed away uh, Mm. in in a sense. Little things really like, you know, my mom's name was Chung Mi and my middle name was Chung Mi. And when I was younger, I used to pretend I didn't have a middle name because Mm. Michelle Zahner sounds so white passing. And I just did. I just never wanted anyone to assume anything about me because I was Asian. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be like this neutral body that could just like prove itself on entry or something like that. And, you know, I was embarrassed that people would mispronounce it like chow mein. So I, I just would do little things like that to kind of like distance myself from that part of myself, I think. I felt reading this book like I really got an interesting view into your mom's personality. And and one of the ways that it really comes out is in like her food preferences. Would you mind reading uh, a little bit where you talk about, you know, the stuff that your mom uh, liked to eat and and the way that she would order her food wherever she might have been? Yeah. What I never seem to forget is what my mother ate. She was a woman of many usuals, half a patty melt on rye with a side of steak fries to share at the Terrace Cafe after a day of shopping, an unsweetened iced tea with half a packet of Splenda, which she would insist she'd never use on anything else. Minestrone she'd order steamy hot, not steaming hot, with extra broth from the Olive Garden. On special occasions, half a dozen oysters on the half shell with champagne mignonette and steamy hot French onion soup from Jake's in Portland. She was maybe the only person in the world who'd request steamy hot fries from a McDonald's drive through in earnest. Jampong, spicy seafood noodle soup with extra vegetables from Cafe Seoul, which she always called Seoul Cafe, transposing the syntax of her native tongue. She loved roasted chestnuts in the winter, though they gave her horrible gas. She liked salted peanuts with light beer. She drank two glasses of Chardonnay almost every day, but would get sick if she had a third. She ate spicy pickled peppers with pizza, At Mexican restaurants, she ordered finely chopped jalapenos on the side. She ordered dressings on the side. She hated cilantro, avocados, and bell peppers. She was allergic to celery. 
She rarely ate sweets, with the exception of the occasional pint of strawberry haagen a bag of tangerine jelly beans, one or two seized chocolate truffles around Christmas time, and a blueberry cheesecake on her birthday. She rarely snacked or took breakfast. She had a salty hand. That was Michelle Zahner reading from her memoir, Crying in H Mart, here on Livewire Radio from PRX. I'm Luke Burbank. That's Elena Passarello over there. Now, we got to take a quick break, but don't go anywhere. When we come back, Michelle is going to tell us what item we simply must take home when shopping at an actual H Mart. Stay with us. Back in a moment. Livewire is brought to you in part by Alaska Airlines. Alaska Airlines offers the most non-stops from the West Coast, including destinations like Hawaii, Costa Rica, and Belize. And as a member of the One World Alliance, Alaska Airlines can connect you to more than 1,000 destinations worldwide with their global partners. Learn more at alaskaair.com. Welcome back to LiveWire. I'm your host, Luke Burbank, here with Elena Passarello. We are listening back to a conversation we had with Michelle Zahner. Uh, She is the musician who plays under the moniker Japanese Breakfast. We are talking to Michelle about her memoir, Crying in H Mart. Let's pick that up now with a question from Elena. What was your approach or, or, or maybe when in the process did you know that food was going to be such an important part of the memoir? From the beginning, really. Um, the first essay I wrote was largely about Mang Chi, who is this Korean YouTube vlogger who has really kind of demystified the Korean cooking process to a lot of English speakers. Um, she's very famous. She has like 5 million uh, YouTube wow. subscribers. <laughs> and she's such a, she's been so generous uh, with her, her time and, and knowledge. And um, yeah, you know, I just thought it was a really sweet story because after my mom passed away, I just was naturally drawn um, to learning how to cook Korean food for a variety of reasons that are in the book, uh, in part because I I felt like my culture needed protecting in a way, that I had always felt like innately Korean because my mom was Korean, and then when she passed away, it felt like this thing I had to really work to preserve. Mm. Um, and yeah, there's a variety of things that happen in the book, but, but I found myself um, turning to this woman and cooking with this woman, and I just thought it was a really sweet story that like, it's kind of like a Korean Julie and Julia, where like this woman <laughs> I had like never met be- had come to mean so much to me and had anchored me d- through, through this really difficult time in my life Um, and you know that sort of was the step towards like why I even ended up in H Mart you know once a week to begin with was because in order to make these recipes I had to go get the ingredients and then I found myself in this grocery store that brought back so many wonderful memories that I had kind of forgotten about Um, and so I always knew that that was going to be the sort of major thematic vehicle in this book. You know, one of the things you also mentioned about your mom was that she did a lot of kooky things, like trying to make you grow taller or like pinch your (laughs) nose when you were a kid and be, I think what we might describe in this day and age as like pretty critical about certain things. When did you start to reconcile this obvious deep love uh, between the two of you with also this kind of, you know, uh, some of the things that, that she was doing to try to make you the best version of yourself? I think you're right. I mean, I think a lot of mothers and daughters have this really complicated relationship. One thing I've quoted a lot, and I'm not entirely sure what episode is it, it it's from, but um, in The Sopranos, uh, Tony says something to Carmelo where he says, like, you know, her and Meadow, their daughter, are fighting. And he says, oh, mothers and their daughters, you know, don't worry, Carm, she'll return to you. I think in a lot of ways that's mm-hmm. some, something that a lot of, um, you know, teenage girls and their moms go through. And, you know, my mom... Uh, one major point of contention between my mom and I was that I had this creative energy and I had this real desire to become, I wanted to become a rock musician. And, you know, as an immigrant parent uh, who had, you know, major cultural differences from me, that was something that my mom felt was really her duty to protect me from. It was something that she felt I did not 
understand the real financial risk of and also the amount of rejection and I was I was bound to face uh, with that sort of lifestyle. So my mom really felt like it was her duty to protect me from that. And, and of course, I just hated her for it because I had discovered this passion that I had and uh, this thing that I loved. And, and I felt like she was really in the way of it. And it wasn't until I went to college and sort of entered my early 20s that, you know, when we had a really meaningful phone call where she said to me, I, I realized I just I just never met someone like you. Mm. And that was like such an intense moment for me because it's not something that you really uh, expect to hear from your parent who's supposed to know you best. And I think that that was sort of her way of saying like, I think I get it now. You mm -hmm. know, this mm -hmm. weird thing I thought you would grow out of is, is not maybe a weird thing that you're going to grow out of. <laughs> um, it's interesting to note, I guess, that the first album you released while playing as Japanese Breakfast um, was after your mom passed away. And, and I know you've described that album as being very much related to your mom's passing. What do you think she would have made of, of, of the fact that that's the album that really puts you on the map for a lot of people musically? I have no idea. I mean, I think that she would be thrilled, you know? I mean, I, I, my mom, unfortunately, never got to see me experience any sort of success as an artist. And, you know, there have been so many uh, times mentally that I've been like, I told you so. Uh, but, <laughs> um, you know, it's a really strange, serendipitous thing. My life became very charmed after she passed away, you know? And, and it feel I'm not a, a religious person or, or a particularly spiritual person, but it does feel like my mom has looked out for me in, in a way because I've I've only had great luck uh, and success as an artist since she passed away and and made this very like personal art about that experience and so yeah I mean I, I'm sure she would be she would be thrilled I recently did like a, a photo shoot for Harper's Bazaar where they put me in a Chanel suit <gasps> and my mom like mm. uh, my mom like most Korean women was like obsessed with Chanel and <laughs> uh, they were like yeah just tilt a little bit show us your tattoos like we like the juxtaposition of the, the luxury with like you know something harder and I was like, God, if my mom could only hear you <laughs> say that. Because like, my mom hated my tattoos and, and would have just been so delighted to um, see me in, like that, you know. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything that you feel like you understand about grief and loss now as we interview you that you wouldn't have known, you know, before your mom got sick? Yeah, actually, um, there's a line in... in you know, there's a lot of sort of borrowed lines from Japanese breakfast songs that made their way into Crying in H Mart that the sort of the real heads will recognize um, <laughs> as the Easter eggs. But Only the real uh, heads know. Only the real heads know. There's a new song uh, that just came out called called Posing in Bondage that uh, I released. And uh, there's a line in that song that says... Um, when the world divides into two people, those who have felt pain and those who have yet to. And, and that line also makes an appearance in the book and is a little bit more thought out. But, um, you know, one thing that grief really opened up to me is I feel like other people who've experienced loss are more readily um, able to connect with you, uh, know, knowing that you've endured the same kind of feeling. And one of the heartbreaking parts of my story is that I felt like things were just starting to get really great again between my mother and I. And I had this very limited few years where, you know, we had sort of like drifted apart in my adolescence and then come back together and start to really appreciate each other as like peers, as adults and, mm -hmm. and be able to confide in each other. And I, I'm very sad that I didn't get to have longer with, with my mother in that way. Mm. Um, a more, uh, I guess, sort of prosaic question. If somebody finds themselves in an H Mart... What is the one thing they have to make sure that they taste or make sure they pick up from like an ingredient section? And then this is a, a, maybe a, a, an impossible question to answer because there's like 8 billion things there. But like what's what's something people should not miss if they find themselves at an H Mart, in your opinion? Um, I mean, I guess like uh, any good Korean, I'd have to say kimchi, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, uh, they have a great <laughs> selection of kimchi <laughs> there, but, uh, you know, something like less, uh, basic, I guess is, um, I'm a big fan of, uh, it's not even Korean, but, uh, Kewpie mayonnaise. I highly recommend, uh, everyone invest in, in a tube of Kewpie mayonnaise. Okay. It's a Japanese mayonnaise and, um, it tastes so much better than, than regular mayonnaise. <laughs> What do you attribute that to? Is it is it just? I think it has MSG in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so QP mayonnaise um, and, and and obviously some kimchi. Michelle, thanks so much for coming on the Live Wire House Party. Thank you so much for having me. That was Michelle Zahner, 
right here on Livewire. Her memoir, Crying in H Mart, is now available as a paperback, and Elena is being turned into a major motion picture. Awesome. Can't wait to see how that uh, how that turns into a movie. So we'll be watching for that. Hey, special thanks this episode to Rosemary King and Kristen Hibbler of Portland, Oregon. Rosemary and Kristen are part of the Livewire member community, and they are supporting the program with a donation each month. And that is a really big deal because it's how we're able to keep doing Livewire week in and week out. So take a moment. Let's all just pause and reflect on the amazing contribution this week from Rosemary and Kristen. Thanks for keeping Livewire going. This is Livewire. As we do each week, we have asked the Livewire listeners a question. Um, we, For reasons that will become apparent later on in the show, we've asked the listeners, what would you like to normalize? Elena has been collecting up those responses. What are you seeing? Ah, how about this one from Brett? Brett would like to normalize Pants Free Friday. I'm uh, way ahead of you there, Brett. <laughs> Pants Free Friday. Is he advocating for um, just not having to go to work, or is we talking about shorts and kilts? Maybe you put yourself in a situation where you, do, if you don't have to wear pants at all, like a full-on Donald Duck kind of situation, mm-hmm. maybe it's that then also forces you to be uh, at home. Right. So it's a, it's a way of managing your your lifestyle and your stress levels by saying this is a day I'm not wearing pants. So that alone dictates that you're not going to be like you know, leading the corporate meeting in the corner office, closing the Jacobson account. <laughs> yeah. All right. What's something else one of our listeners wants to normalize? Two people said the same thing, but Derek and Jay would like to normalize saying no without qualifying it. So not giving excuses, not having to explain, just uh, just saying no thanks and then moving on. What do you think about that? I think that might be my lifetime challenge. Like, not that I'm overly sort of solicitous, but I, as uh, much of my time in therapy has been working on saying something and having people be okay with it and being okay with them having their feelings about it. That's the journey for me. I don't know. I mean, what's wrong with qualifying your nose? <laughs> in general, like, it's, it's always good to know why. No, I'm sorry, I, I'm too swamped. Or, no, I'm sorry, uh, I, I don't drive at night anymore. Or whatever, <laughs> whatever the reason is. <laughs> uh, well, that's why I have no pants Friday. I just stay home. I don't drive. Mm-hmm. I don't have to make any excuses to anyone. I have to explain myself. It's a, it's a great scene. All right, one more thing that one of our listeners wants to normalize. <laughs> Steve says, I would like to normalize cats walking on a leash. Which, yes, now how's Bubbles doing in the old leash training department? Well, I could never quite, this is my cat Bubbles we're talking about, I could never quite get her to walk with me on the leash, but it was a very great way to be outside and let her be outside uh, and not be worried that she was going to get nicked by a bobcat or something. My only pandemic accomplishment was I taught my cat to walk. First, we had a leash, but again, like it just, she doesn't love it as much, like kind of trotting alongside you. But once I took the leash away, she does it. She does invisible leash. We have a a very, like a set route around the neighborhood. We do not veer from it. So she knows kind of the way that we're going. And for like two years now, (laughs) I take her on a little walk. Uh, Well, listen, thanks to everyone who sent in their reactions to our audience question. We'll have another one for next week's show at the end of this program. This is Livewire Radio. Our next guest has appeared on Late Night with Jimmy Fallon and as well as Conan and Comedy Central. As an actor, he's had roles on Marin and Inside Amy Schumer. His third comedy album, King Scorpio, is out now. Here's Sean Patton, recorded in front of a live audience at the Holt Center for the Performing Arts in Eugene, Oregon. Thank you. How are you? I don't like, do you know that moment when you're at, a, when you're at the airport and your bag goes through the machine and then, and, and then before it rejoins you on your journey, it zips into that other line because now they're going to search it manually, right? That moment is bad for me because my head will jump to insane places in that moment. I'm like, is there a pistol in my carry-on? Why do I own a pistol and why is it in my carry-on? Am I a bank robber? Why don't I remember robbing any banks? Oh, wait, it's a bottle of water. I should have drank that water. 
I don't like, like I don't like that moment because it messes up my timing. I get to every single airport early for one reason: unlimited fast food. I allow myself unlimited fast food in airports only. Why? Because of all the calories you burn while flying. Did you know this? When your body is above 25,000 feet for an extended period of time, it begins to burn five to seven times the calories to account for the shortage of oxygen at that altitude. Did you know that? That's what I tell myself. You know? Who cares where the facts come from these days as long as the source is confident? It's the era of the podcast. Like, I suppose I fly a lot, so I suppose I appreciate the TSA, but they get on my nerves because they act like every airport follows the exact same set of rules, and they don't. It's different, okay? Like, I should be TSA pre check. I'm not because I've made three appointments, missed them all, terrified to make a fourth one, okay? So... But it, like sometimes you'll go like three airports in a row. You take your shoes off, put them in the bin. But then you'll get to that one airport where you put them in the bin and that's the day they're like, no, sir, 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 sir. Those go directly on the belt, sir. And I want to be like, put them on the belt then. You got two free gloved hands. I'm disassembling my CPAP for you so you don't think it's a nuclear warhead. But you can't do that, so I comply, and I put them uh, on the belt, but they still have to make that announcement that, ladies and gentlemen, your shoes go directly on the belt. Like I'm the jerk. Makes me just want to respond in that same cadence, like, then tell that to every other airport in the country. Asheville, North Carolina, regional airport. What do you even know about security? Your TSA is a family business. North Carolina is full of those little tiny baby airports where their TSA is like, we're tough too. We're going to get you. Like, like there's a Wilmington, North Carolina. Ever heard of it? Yeah. It's got the Wilmington, North Carolina International Airport. International Wilmington. You close at 10.30 p.m. You have two baggage claims. International you got Turkish Airways flights landing every week. Backpackers getting off like, we will begin our tour of America in its favorite city, Wilmington. Home of Air Michael Jordan and Five Seasons Dawson's Creek. Like they don't, was that a snort? Thank you, every time, an, every time someone snorts, a comedian gets a wish, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. I think that place meant to call itself the Wilmington International <laughs> Airport. Like, we're international. We fly in the nation. We're international. <laughs> but Bob messed up when he was making the sign, stuck a T in there, you know. I don't mind, though. Looks like a cross. Reminds me of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Hallelujah. He was watching over us even when we mucked something up. Normalize farting in public in 2022. It's about time. Let's all just grow up as a society, okay? It's something every human being has to do three to 15 times a day, okay? It's a necessity, okay? And I know sometimes it smells bad, and that's the point. Wake you up. You're, you smell a terrible fart. Like, I'm ready. I'm ready for the day. You think that's accidental? That's by design, okay? Also, it's hilarious. It's, a, it's something, it's a gift that Mother Nature gave us that we have decided was just not classy enough, but no, okay? If you can't laugh at a well-timed fart, walk into a body of water, short yourself out because your simulation sucks, you know what I mean? Like, I live, in, I live in New York City, okay? I live where everyone thinks they are more important than everyone else all the time, okay? And I was riding the A train from Brooklyn to Manhattan. I like to be specific. I don't like to just say subway. Anyone can take the subway. I'm a, I'm a real New Yorker. I'm not just going to. I, I was riding the subway from my apartment at 377 St. Mark's Avenue, apartment 2R, 11238. That's my actual. I just gave you my actual. Ad, that's interesting. All right. So 
I was riding it to the West 4th Street stop in Manhattan, just so you know. Now, it was an afternoon train ride, and it was a tense ride. Okay, everyone's on their phones, reading about, you know, what's going on in Ukraine, reading about Elon Musk buying Twitter, just everyone's stressed out about the ridiculous scape that is this reality, and a brave soul on board that car unleashed a beaut. I'm talking a perfect just in every way, a perfect raspberry rim shot, it was the kind of fart you'd plug into a keyboard to make like the fart sound when you press that key. It was perfect in every way. It was a full octave. I believe it was in the key of G sharp. And you could tell that person wasn't sick at all. They were in good health. It wasn't a wet, sloppy sound. It was a dry, had a nice audible walnut finish. Yeah, you know, like, it was a, 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 and you could see everyone hear it. You saw everyone hear the fart, but once again, it's New York, where everyone thinks they're just the better than, no, I can't, I didn't work this hard to get here to react to a fart. I have followers on TikTok, I'm important. And we have to wear masks on the train still, and the masks hide the identity of the fighter. There are little giveaways, little nuances in the face of thy who dealt it, that, you know, the the flare of a nostril, you know? Right? The smirk, the prideful smirk. All of that's hidden by the mask. So if the farter doesn't just actively identify themselves, You'd never know. So no one knew it was me. This is my point. No one had a clue. Thank you all very much. You're amazing. You're an amazing crowd. Sean Patton. That was Sean Patton, recorded in front of a live audience at the Holt Center for Performing Arts in April. I feel really confident, Elena, saying... That is the most flatulent-related content you will hear on public radio (laughs) today. He goes straight to the fart. Unless maybe like Radio Lab or somebody has a whole episode on why our bodies do that. Right. But as far as stand-up comedy goes, I think that's that's the most you're going to hear today on your public radio station. By the way, Sean's latest album, King Scorpio, is available now. This is Livewire. Our musical guest this week, Kurt Vile is a singer, songwriter, multi-instrumentalist, expert forklift driver, it turns out. Uh, He's also known for his solo work and for his time with the band The War on Drugs. Uh, He's also collaborated with basically everyone I love in the world, John Prine, Courtney Barnett, Dinosaur Jr., Mm. among lots of others. His ninth studio album, Watch My Moves, came out back in April. It is the creative result of two years at home with his family, Uh, This is after more than a decade of near-constant touring for Kurt. Rolling Stone calls the album a majestically mellow zone-out session. Very, very excited to welcome the pride of Philadelphia, PA, Kurt Vile to Livewire. Woohoo! Thank you. We are so excited to have you here. Big, big fans of your work over the years. Um, I'm curious, uh, one of the tracks off this new album is Mount Airy Hill, Way Gone. And I read somewhere that you said that that neighborhood, like moving to that neighborhood of Philadelphia for you, has been life-changing. What is it about Mount Airy that has changed your life? I mean, I, okay, I moved to Mount Airy, where I am right now, after a long tour. It's just like there's, I'm still in Philly, I'm still in the city, but there's trees everywhere mm. and woods. And next thing you know, you're up in, in the mountains. You feel like you're all of a sudden last of the Mohicans or something. It's at first <laughs> it's disorienting and then it's completely orienting, you know, but yeah. So like life was hectic back in 2016 and it's mm-hmm. since gotten hectic again, but I, I was always imagining being able to just stay here mm. and like put it all, all the rest of, of the world, you know, keep it away and like just kind of work on music here. Cause it's, Cause it's just the best of both worlds. It's just beautiful, and I'm still in the city. But I got my wish. Not exactly the way I would have thought I'd get my wish, but pro- maybe the only way I would get my wish is to stay home and be here <laughs> like two years straight, yeah. more or less. You know, uh, right? You're you're touring again, and you're going to be touring. Are you looking forward 
to that energy or are you kind of feeling sad about like leaving your, you know, your family and going back to that world of a touring musician? When I left, it was very hard. And my, my youngest, well, everybody was upset, but uh, my youngest in particular, she was crying really hard when I left. And it was just for a press tour to go to Europe on the day the record comes out and things like that. And then I was going to go into hectic rehearsals with the band and it still is bittersweet. But I, once I was on the move again and performing, it's what I do. So it felt natural. So it's just about the balance. You know, now I've had time to figure out I just can't be gone all the time. I can't just tour nonstop. There's got to be breaks in between, you know, and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. when a record comes out, sure, you're going to go. I went on a six week tour. You just got to do it. But I'm not going to go on a one year straight tour. You know? uh-huh. <laughs> um, I've seen you perform live a lot and I've listened to your albums extensively. And in the songs, you seem to be the most chill person ever. You just seem totally unperturbed. Like, I always think I wish I could be as chill as Kurt Vile seems to be when he's singing. <laughs> Are you really that way or is that like a, is that an act? I mean, I, uh, that's my ideal self, you know, that's where I want to be, you know, and when I'm playing music, I usually feel that way, but I definitely get really stressed out, but I'm, I'm trying to get to a place where I am completely laid back. I like, like when I have anything to do, I like to get up two or three hours before I have to do anything so I can just take it real slow and be in the zone and maybe that's what i'm trying to do when i'm playing my music except in in addition to that my music is if not always like hypnotic you know so Mm. i'm like kind of just grooving to whatever repetitive chords i'm playing and that probably chills me out a little bit too i'm luke burbank here with elena passarello we are talking to the musician kurt vile got to take a quick break but don't go anywhere because when we come back we will hear a song from kurt so stay with us welcome back to live wire from prx all right before we get out of here a little preview of next week's show we are going to be talking to kelsey mckinney who is the host of the very popular podcast from defector media it's called normal gossip and if you have not heard the show, you really, you're really missing out. It's basically like really funny, juicy gossip about people that you will never meet. And it is really, really entertaining. We're also going to talk to the poet Brenda Shaughnessy about her new collection of poems. It's called Tanya. Uh, it's about female artists and mentors. And in a roundabout way, it's her trying to find her college roommate, who the book is named for. And then we're going to close the show out with uh, some music from the stunningly talented Grammy Award winner, Madison Cunningham. And as always, we're going to be looking to get your response to our listener question. Elena, what are we asking listeners for next week's show? We want to know, what is some gossip that only you care about? (laughs) So it's a real niche gossip. (laughs) If you have an answer to our listener question for next week's show, go ahead and hit us up on social media. We're at Twitter and Facebook at at LiveWire radio before the break we were talking to kurt vile yes that kurt vile let's pick up that conversation now and hear a song uh one of the tracks off of this album uh mount airy hill way gone you're yodeling in the song is that a first for you uh it's funny you mentioned that because yeah it's it's yodeling in the hank williams Mm. Mm. jimmy rogers sense uh not yodelay he who you know <laughs> and it's funny that you mentioned that because like right before my very first session for this record which was a couple years ago at this point it was pre-pandemic it was november 2019 that ken burns country music documentary yeah. came out mm. and i was so stoked because and i was a little protective because i was like this is like all the books i've read and all this music i've studied mm. for so long and now the hipsters are just getting it handed to them <laughs> but somehow i don't haven't heard many people talk about it so no they're gonna figure out what a wild man george jones was yeah yeah, when, yeah. like tammy wynette took away his car keys and he would like drive his riding lawnmower to the liquor store <laughs> exactly <laughs> but anyway episode one jimmy rogers and and uh i like have notes i'm like so inspired my my note to myself is literally just two words it's gotta yodel <laughs> you know like <laughs> and then i think it was reinforced like once episode three or whatever it was the hillbilly shakespeare hank williams you know who i grew up on through my dad like if you could pull off the yodel you know which i haven't fully done but uh, 
best I could in that song. I, I pulled it off yeah. best I could in that song. Uh, speaking of of legendary musicians, you collaborated with uh, the great John Prine on uh, that version of How Lucky. I'm wondering, though, like when you were working with him, are you learning stuff from him? Because I mean, you were already an established musician in your own right. You know how to make your music. But is that a process where you're actually learning things about, about how to do music that you didn't have before? Of course. I mean, I'm so excited when I get to meet him. I've already learned plenty from him. I've consumed him before I met him. You know, that's right. why I want to meet him. Mm-hmm. Uh, so plenty of things through osmosis, but then, yeah, just hanging out with him. And it's funny, by the time he was in the studio to do the song How Lucky With Me, which was a little bef- a few days before New Year's 2020 in Nashville, mm. uh, he talked plenty. And in that moment, I just couldn't believe he was in the studio. So it was like I couldn't even hear him. I'm like, uh-huh, uh-huh. You know? <laughs> but, yeah. then I heard, you know, I, I could hear, but I couldn't process it. Like after he was gone, I heard what he said, you know, <laughs> which is funny, a funny <laughs> idea. But, you know, but true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I saw somewhere, I don't even remember where I saw this, but it was a quote from you talking about at uh, some point in your life when you were driving a forklift. Did mm-hmm. that ever happen? Is that, am I misremembering that? Did you have a job driving a forklift at some point? Oh, yeah. I had two jobs driving a forklift, in <laughs> fact. And the first one was uh, I moved up to Boston for a couple of years while my wife was getting – well, she wasn't my wife then, but she was getting her master's. And I had my reality check basically where I got a job packing boxes or whatever, and I showed up and it was – it was just my reality check. I was working with a bunch of, you know, serious ball busters, uh, <laughs> like with uh, departed style accents, you know, strong uh, Southie uh, energy. Yeah, yeah. In Everett, Massachusetts, you know, driving a forklift, unloading tractor trailers. And by the time I left there in 2022, 23, I was like, I'm never driving a forklift ever again. But I did, you know, I became a master of it. And then I worked at Philadelphia Brewing Company and they had a forklift there. And I was like, oh, I can actually drive these. And then Next thing you know, I was just the best forklift driver in <laughs> Philadelphia. So they would Ooh. ask me to use it all the time. You know, I'm, I might be exaggerating, but I feel like not, you know. No, I believe uh, you. <laughs> but they they couldn't believe how good I was that driving a forklift at that job became like I'd be doing way worse jobs. And then they're like, Kurt, you're, you're needed on the forklift. And then I was like, just it's almost like flying a plane, you know. <laughs> it's just, it was fun. Are you writing songs in your head while you're driving the forklift? Yeah, or I, I love those blue collar type of jobs because the repetitive tasks, I could always just write songs in my head. Uh, my favorite thing I wrote at the brewing company was uh, In a Black Hole, I Found a Broken Skull, Now I'm Already Gone, which is from uh, my song Jesus Fever. Uh-huh. But I, I don't think I was driving the forklift. I think I was completely hung over cleaning kegs. But otherwise, <laughs> it's still a great – it was like one missing line in that song. And then I was like, oh, that's it. And then maybe, uh, I, maybe I threw up. <laughs> that sounds like <laughs> – Really tough hungover duty dealing with old Oof. alcohol remains in a keg. That's just like the last yeah. thing you want to be doing when you're hungover. Right, but in another way, you could uh, just take one sip of beer and it helps a little. Right? Hair of the dog. Hair of the dog. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, uh, we're excited to hear a, a song off of this new album, Watch My Moves. What track are we going to hear? Oh, yeah, okay. I'm going to play you um, Flying Like a Fast Train. All right, this is Kurt Vile on Livewire. Here we go. Flying like a fast train, I don't feel a thing Till when I pull into my station, I just crash and burn, yeah Playing in the music room in my underwear Feeling fine and then my sake crumble, pell-mell stumble I've been bamboozled, better watch out, cause we got vampires lurking Flying like a fast train, I don't feel a thing Till when I pull into my station, I just crash and burn Yeah, alright then Alright then 
Flying acid flashback, flying saucers, black coffee, pink lemonade from the faucet, seeing dragons. But they're so pretty, baby, come on, let's go tear up the city. No, I think we better slow it down. Comfort can't touch a thing, so I take a walk round the block, then I come back and say, Say what's wearing you down, kid? We'll try a little out of everything. Flying like a fast train, I don't feel a thing. Till when I pull into my station, I just crash and burn. Yeah. Yeah. Woo! It's Kurt Vile right here on Livewire. <laughs> Song off the new album, Watch My Moves. Ow, ow. Kurt. I put my lips near the phone for that. Hopefully there's not no siblings. <laughs> <laughs> no, that sounded great. Love okay, it. Okay, cool. I rehearsed that yodel a little, but then because we talked about it, I was like, oh, I better not <laughs> be a wimp. I better at least try and do this. Well, uh, uh, again, Kurt, thank you for taking the time to come on the show. Thanks for coming on Livewire, man. Yeah, thank you so much. That was Kurt Vile right here on Livewire. His latest album, Watch My Moves, is available now. All right, that's going to do it for this week's episode of Livewire. A huge thanks to our guests, Michelle Zahner, Sean Patton, and Kurt Vile. Livewire is brought to you in part by Alaska Airlines. Laura Haddon is our executive producer. Heather D. Michelle is our executive director. Our producer and editor is Melanie Sevchenko. Molly Pettit is our technical director and mixer. And our house sound is by D. Neil Blake. Trey Hester is our assistant editor. Our marketing and production manager is Paige Thomas. Rosa Garcia is our operations associate. Tanvi Kumar is our production fellow. And Yasmin Median is our intern. Our house band is Ethan Fox Tucker, Sam Tucker, A.L. Alves, and A. Walker Spring, who also composes our music. Additional funding provided by the Regional Arts and Culture Council and the James F. and Marion L. Miller Foundation. Livewire was created by Robin Tenenbaum and Kate Sokoloff. This week, we'd like to thank members Rosemary King and Kristen Hibbler of Portland, Oregon. For more information about our show or how you can listen to our podcast, head on over to livewireradio.org. I'm Luke Burbank for Elena Passarello and the whole Livewire crew. Thank you for listening, and we will see you next week. Dear Livewire, when we first met, I was really shy. I had no idea we'd spend so much time together or that you'd be one to fill my heart with, with joy and make me want to be a better person. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were here. I was busy reading a review from one of our many, many rapturously smitten listeners. Oh, wait, actually, no, sorry. This is from Elena. Anyway, the point is, uh, it would be really helpful if you wanted to leave us a review Feel free to say really nice things about us, and uh, we'll even read them now and then on the show. So you might hear your review of Livewire read on the program itself. Uh, Reviews help other people hear about the show, and then we can keep doing this for a long, long time, because we love having this job. Uh, Thank you so much if you've left a review, and if you're about to leave a review, you can go ahead and do it right where you get the podcast.